Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all today. Um, Well, I was thinking about my cat, (laughs) Woofy, who, um, um, some of you knew Rufi. Uh, it's, um, it was a 2004, we, we finally had to uh, put him down. Very, very uh, sad moment for us. And, uh, but he was a wonderful cat. <laughs> and I wanna talk a little bit about what Rufi knows or knew. And um, anyway. But he was a wonderful little, he was a neutered male, so he was kind of large. And also he, he looked like a little lion. He had like the coloration of a lion and maybe a slight mane. <laughs> and, but he was, he was a cat, it was a house cat. And, um, <clears throat> but he was uh, quite a character. And uh, uh, we named him Rufy, my wife, Jean, she, she thought that Rufus would be appropriate because he was somewhat reddish. And um, well, we ended up calling him Rufy, Rufus P. Underfoot, actually. P stood for pest and he was always under your feet. So it, it was his full name, <laughs> but he was a, quite a cat. And in fact, he was more like a dog than a cat. Would even come if you called him. And uh, I remember one time you know, a guest was over and they were leaving and and we were talking about Rufy had already been around showing himself, but then he was gone at this point. And, uh, but uh, Jean, my wife, she said, well, you can, you know, you can call him. She, you can't call a cat. And so she called him 10 seconds later, here he comes. You know, it's like, hey, any games, anybody want to play or any cheese or something? You know, he, he was always uh, interested in something we humans might uh, come up with. And uh, anyway, well, that was Rufy. And uh, I remember it was getting near the end of his time with us, but uh, I'd come downstairs, whatever. I went into the kitchen, passing by the refrigerator, and I just happened to notice that the refrigerator door was open a bit, about the width of a cat's head, maybe. <laughs> I didn't think too much of it, and I just closed the door and uh, went on with whatever I was doing. And a day or two later, same thing. I was passing through the kitchen. Here's the kitchen, the refrigerator door open that same width. And hmm, a little odd. We're having trouble with our refrigerator. What's the deal here? And uh, then finally a third time, I remember I just happened to be just working in the kitchen. Well, I don't know what I was doing, but I, don't, I wasn't doing much, but I was at the counter opposite the refrigerator. So I had my back to the refrigerator and I was alone in the kitchen, at least I thought. And all of a sudden I heard some <laughs> movement at the, with the refrigerator door. I looked around, here's Rufy pulling at the bottom of the refrigerator door. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, this is a little cat. You know, I mean, it looks like a lion. Yeah, you know, he's pretty sturdy as a, as a house cat, but you're still just a little animal. And all of a sudden the door opens and to that same width, then he stands there and he's looking in the refrigerator. <laughs> he knows there's cheese in there and other goodies, you know, but he stands there and it's like, he's just overwhelmed with, <laughs> there's so much here, you know, and he probably has to think it through. So he stands there a bit and then he just trots off. Of course he leaves the door open and, well, that explained the, the mystery of the refrigerator door. And we rigged up a way to counter that. But um, anyway, but I thought that was uh, very interesting. You know, he had a certainly just from his thinking and observing, you see us pull open that door. And, and uh, of course, we would pull it from the handle up on top of the door. He was reaching for the, so I remember I went down there too. How could he do that? And uh, so I just took my finger, which was probably roughly the size of his paw, I suppose. And I tugged at it and sure enough, it just opened very, very easily. There was very little uh, resistance to that. If you pull from the bottom of the door, it really surprised me. I went back up and 
tried the, the handle on the door and it was quite a bit of resistance, you know, a lot more than, no, I don't think he would have been able to pull that open. But, um, but anyways, through his, it was very interesting. There's an animal of a different species than us. And, um, uh, but he's um, uh, thinking it through, he observes, he sees us opening and closing the door. There's something of interest in there for him, he knows. <laughs> but um, when he gets it open, of course, like the cat that, or the dog that catches the car kind of a thing, like, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> so he was like overwhelmed or something because he didn't really do it. I'm not, I'm surprised he didn't actually, maybe at some point he would have actually jumped into the <laughs> refrigerator or something. But um, anyway, but it was interesting to observe that. And, uh, but it makes me think, you know, we, we know things too, of course. And, uh, but what we're really about, and maybe this was even expressed in Rufi's life, uh, maybe not quite so much as it might seem in ours, but what it is that we really want is to know, to understand, to have some sense of how the world works, you know, what is taking place here, what's going on. I don't think it really rises in us so much that we're consciously aware that this is a, a deep need that we have and a desire. But it is certainly there, just as it wasn't for Rufi that he wasn't analyzing what he's thinking or feeling. Then he's just observing and testing and stuff like that. And um, so, and just giving this some consideration and um, it doesn't matter really, I guess, if we're, you know, whatever form of life we are, not particularly if, if we're at least mammal, um, we're going to explore. And maybe gradually put things together. I remember, I don't know if it was Jane Goodall or, or, or who that talked of, uh, there was this troop of um, chimps, I guess, that were, uh, uh, down by a kind of a little stream that had a lot of pebbles. It was kind of just a pebbly shore there. And I guess there was seeds or something that would land from a tree and that would be among the pebbles there. And the chimps would pick them out and eat them and you know, pick another. And there's one female, she um, maybe was just observing something there. And, and anyway, at some point she picks up the clump of um, gravel, whatever, and put the seeds in it and just throws it into the water, the stream that was right there. And immediately the pebbles dropped to the bottom, of course, and the seeds were floating. She just scooped them up with her hand. It's a much more efficient way to, um, you know, to feed yourself. And, to <laughs> and, um, and they observed Again, I don't know if it's Jane, I don't know what, what, what the study was, but but they observed then that this knowledge of this more efficient way to gather seeds and to eat, you know, uh, was starting to spread. It spread to other members of the troop, and then perhaps beyond that, even to other troops, perhaps. It's like accumulation of know-how, you know, knowing something, understanding something. And this is very important, I think for all of all forms of life really. And, uh, and certainly no less so for us human beings, especially when we have these incredible minds that we have now on our prehensile hands and, and opposable thumbs and, and stereoscopic vision, all of this stuff that, that we have that we can, combined with rather powerful intellect, we can uh, begin to do a lot of things. And um, again, I was saying that I think one of the most, I think goes unnoticed by most of us. We don't really think about it directly unless we're philosophers or something like that, maybe scientists or perhaps theologians. But um, this matter of knowing what is going on. I, I even talked about this in my book, uh, Buddhism, Plain and Simple. I think, you know, some of you know that book. And uh, 
for those of you that haven't read it or, <laughs> or are stumbling over the, well, I'll say it, it's the cow picture in the book. Uh, I put this picture in the book, it's of a cow, but it's just in black and white, but kind of just big chunks of black and, and white. Uh, it's not easy to see the cow at first. Once you see the cow, it's from a high contrast black and white photograph is where I, where I got it, but it, um, it doesn't stand out as a cow. I've only one person I've encountered has said immediately they saw a cow. Uh, but for most of us, and some people would look at it and I get half the mail I've gotten on that book. And I mean, it's like hundreds, maybe thousands of <laughs> letters and messages I've received and, and about half of them I would say are about that, that cow picture. Hard to see, but the point I was making about that in the book was, and this is a point that nobody ever reflected, or very few anyway, reflected on was, I, I invite the reader to look at your state of mind now. And you first glance at this picture and you don't know what it is. I was want to draw attention to the uncomfortableness of not knowing. Look at your state of mind and when you don't know, there's something uncomfortable. I mean, it doesn't keep you awake at night or whatever. Well, in some cases, from some letters, I think maybe that did happen to a few, but uh, something like that isn't going to But this is it. We want to know what's going, just to put us at ease in some way. And I invite the reader to notice when you finally see what it is, because most people would see it after a few minutes or maybe coming back to it once or twice. What I wanted you to notice is the shift in your mind. This is very important, that there is a shift there and you, if you're giving attention to it, you can feel it, you, you can notice it quite easily. And whereas before, it's not that the cult picture is gonna be that urgent or anything, but still there's a little bit of agitation there, a little bit of discomfort, irritation, kind of bothers you a bit. When suddenly you see it, all of that drops away. The mind settles down, it's at ease. This is extremely important for us human beings. And uh, in the last couple of talks I've given, I've kind of been pointing to this. Uh, you know, if you're interested in waking up, it's important to start to notice this. And also to help find ways to just settle down and to put your mind at ease. You know, there's, you can discover this unadorned quietude that I spoke of last time I was talking here. So this is rather important. So this is a matter of wanting to know. So here as human beings, we evolve to the level of sophistication that we now have with our minds and our abilities to physically and just to manipulate the environment, all of that. But without knowing, there's something deep in the heart and mind of, of us humans maybe in cats and dogs as well. It's a bit unsettling. Uh, but certainly, you know, for, for us. And I think we human beings have set out in ways to try to understand what's going on in this human life and in this world. There's something driving us to this because we need to know, we want to know, we have to know. Again, I don't think we're so consciously aware that that's really what's behind an awful lot. We have, well, I want this, I want that, but there's a lot of superficial things that we're constantly reaching for. So we're, the mind isn't settled and we're not paying attention to the deep need of the heart. But it's there, whether we're aware of it or not. But over time, I think human beings have devised ways of trying to gain knowledge. And I think, uh, I don't think it's excluded to these two, but I think what we've developed is science and religion. Religion probably first, I don't know, depending on how we want to define these things. And I'm talking about religion now in terms of it, the word that it comes from, religio, it means to, to bind or to rebind, to bind back with what? Well, I would say in this case, truth. 
reality, knowing that, binding with that, discovering that, coming to that. So I mean religion in this sense. Um, Scott Edelstein, my, my literary agent, uh, a lot of you know him, I think. Um, he um, recently introduced me to um, a rabbi that I know another one of his clients. And he says, you guys think so much alike. And uh, <laughs> so he wanted to get us in touch with each other. And we've had a few Zoom meetings and stuff and discussions, which I, th I, th I don't know, I think they're gonna, or Scott's gonna transcribe and put it, I don't, it might be published somewhere. I don't know, I really don't know. Um, something's gonna come of it, I guess. But anyway, um, but getting to know this fellow, this rabbi, yeah, in many ways we do. We think in very similar ways. He's using different language than I would use, you know, as I'm using different language from him in, in cases. But um, coming to, you know, very, very similar uh, understand, or realizing that we have very similar understandings about what's going on and uh, or how we might speak of it or talk to it or communicate with each other across maybe differences of culture and language and stuff like this. And uh, that's interesting because there is a kind of knowledge there. I'm gonna say more about this, but I want to turn momentarily here to say how science works, which is another very powerful way. Perhaps many would see more powerful than religion way to really know and understand the human world and the human life and the physical world that we live in and all of this. And I think of uh, what I'm interested in here is the way in which these two religion and science work when they work. They often don't work so well, but particularly with religion, but, uh, but when they work, if the work is, as I was saying, defining religion, religio, uh, religion as you know, from religio, meaning you know, to, to rebind with truth, reality. If we're looking at it that way, science too, wanting to get to the truth, wanting to understand, wanting to know. Science comes from skio, which means you know, to know. And um, uh, so different ways of knowing, we could say. But in looking at this and the way science would operate is well, you make an observation. I'm just to give an example of thinking of um, Galileo as a young person who's, I think, believe he was 16 years old when he was observing the chandelier at his cathedral there in Italy somewhere. And how it, it, maybe summertime they'd open some windows or something nearby and a gust of wind would come in and the chandelier would sway. And he was noticing that. And maybe another, and it would kind of settle down the chandelier, and a gust of wind would come and it would begin to sway again. And what he was knowing, what noticing was that uh, it seemed the chandelier, no matter, even if it was in a large swing or a small swing, it kept the same time back and forth and back. That didn't change whether it was a big swing or a small swing, it kept the same timing. And he, tested it against his own uh, pulse <laughs> enough for him to confirm in his mind that, yeah, this is good. And then he started experimenting with pendulums and inclines and it's like with gravity basically led to all kinds of things, including with the pendulum, with pendulum clocks, which came along after Gal Gal Galileo's discoveries, something very functional and useful. And of course, from there even, uh, oh, through another fellow who I figured, what was his name? I forget now, starts with an H. <laughs> but he, he ended up uh, developing the kind of technology, the pendulum that would work like in a, say, a wristwatch that came along later. But the same, again, the same thing. You get a, a pendulum operating, and you give it a little nudge, it'll, it'll always keep the same time. Of course, then there's problems that they start to discover like Rufy standing at the refrigerator door. He immediately he's got other problems here. It's gonna take him a while to figure it out. <laughs> Say the here with the pendulum uh, temperature and pressure and things like this would affect it, you know, and, and stuff like this. It was the length of the pendulum that 
was was important here. If you shorten it, then it moves faster. If you lengthen it, it slows down. But if you keep that length, like in the, in the cathedral there, the chandelier, wasn't changing the length of the, you know, the, the pendulum there. And it was keeping the same time. Well, through experimentation, Galileo quickly learned all of this, surmised all this, and, and, um, and but that's then how science kind of operates. Other people can come along and, and test it as well. And we can make these observations about all sorts of things in the world. And what, how does science operate? Well, you observe something, maybe you can kind of isolate the very thing that you're observing. You don't want to have too many factors in there, extraneous factors. And, and then you can rig up different ways of testing that. So you, you write out your, well, you, you think about it, you look at it, you write out your hypothesis, you know, your, your guess, your estimate your, of, you know, of what's going on there. And then you test it and you make it so the test can be repeated and other people can come along and test it as well. And maybe you need to tweak it and change it and, and, and uh, 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 over time and gradually you, you kind of close in on something that really seems to be pretty effective. That you then might be able to combine with other kind of hypotheses about other various aspects and things like this. And you can, there's like bricks you can put into a wall and gradually you're building this one. That wall will be what in science they would call theory. Theory isn't just sitting back in your easy chair, smoking a pipe and just dreaming up things. We, we in common everyday parlance, we talk that way, I guess. <laughs> Some people think that well, this is just a theory. Well, science it has been hammered out in small pieces and chunks and placed together and see how they work together. It's, by the time you get to something that they would call theory, you're getting a pretty solid structure there. But this is a way, I wanna get back to the main point I'm making here that this is a, one way that we human beings have devised in this pretty effective way to get to knowledge, to get to understanding, to get the truth, to how the world is and how it operates, and to have some understanding of not just the mechanics of it, but in all sorts of other ways as well. Uh, that we get some understanding of the workings of what's taking place here. So we're not just kind of blindly. Uh, walking through life and bumping into one thing or another and having no idea <laughs> what's going on or why that occurred and it'll be repeated again and, you know, and diseases uh, will sweep through again and things like this because we're not learning lessons or, you know, like back during the, uh, the, the black, black death, the black plague and you know, people had all kinds of ideas. Uh, but they weren't particularly effective. Uh, probably not effective at all. Well, I guess actually there were a couple of things that did sort of work, but I don't want to get into all that. But basically, it didn't understand it. So it ends up killing what a third or more of the population of Europe, say, during the Black Death. But so there's an urgency to know, and science uh, comes along, and we figured that one out pretty much, but um, still, like with the current thing that we're dealing with now, COVID. Yeah, we're not handling it very well. Uh, I think the scientists that are on top of it are probably doing a pretty good job, but then we have plenty of other people who aren't listening to that, might be suspicious of that. Science, all that. I'm gonna get back to this. But this is a different kind of knowing than say where religion is operating. And, uh, and it seems pretty airtight in many ways. I mean, after all, it's given us this modern world with sirens and we bend to the moon and, and uh, we can do a great deal to fight this virus that we're, that this pandemic that we're dealing with now. But many other things, we all know this, but not all of this is uh, necessarily good or progress. That's another problem. There's something maybe in our reservoir of knowledge here or what we're building on, the bricks we're putting into the wall uh, there's some aspects of this that aren't really being handled, perhaps. I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to turn back to religion again in my discussions with um, um, uh, the, the rabbi that I've been, been in discussion with for a while. Anyway, uh, but I remember at one point I told him that I thought, well, no, 
My favorite verse of mine out of the Bible is be still and know. And then I said, and then it goes on with something else. And I said, I, that doesn't, but I said, I think if you just stop right there, be still and know. And he said, yes. He said, but there is a third part. I said, yes, I know. I know that I am God. He said, yes. You know? And then he uh, kind of gave his take on that. Because I just love it. Yeah, be still. Talking about undisturbed, quiet, or uh, unadorned quietude. Just be still. And the knowing is already with us. But if we're still, we might notice that. But be still and, and know. But then he said that I am God. He said, well, you know, in the ancient uh, Hebrew, uh, I, I guess that what he knows all sorts of languages, actually. But he said, uh, they don't have the word I. Or at least it isn't like what we mean. And he said, it's more like, he made a translation as if into English, but it's, of course, not standard English at all. But he said, the term there is I am. What was I, like capital I hyphen ing, I am. Uh, and as we talked, it started to become clear to me. I realized that he's talking about this I am, the way he's speaking of it, is how we might talk of, say, big self or something in this, on this order. And um, uh, I, I don't know if I dare use the, I, I want to use his name, but I don't know if I should because I didn't ask, I didn't know I was going to be talking. <laughs> and so I don't know if I want to use his name publicly without getting his permission. But um, so I'll just say the rabbi, but the rabbi, um, uh, and he's acquainted with, he's acquainted with Zen and Buddhism. He's acquainted with Taoism. He's acquainted with, um, uh, was it Vedanta? Is that, is that how that's pronounced? Uh, and, and other uh, traditions as, as well. And um, as, as well as uh, Christianity. And, um, uh, but um, what was the point I was making here that, uh, no, I've lost it. Um, well, this matter of, of eyeing, yes, okay. And, and, so we spoke of others, like in Taoism, for example, too, and I stirred some of you onto this book that I discovered a while back uh, by China Root. And I think, did you have a seminar on that or something? I forget. But um, uh, where there, the scholar David Hinton, uh, he's talking about the Tao as this, this, this presence and absence. And... Um, uh, that they're speaking of there and this there's presence, which is like just this, this world of this and that, the manifest world, the 10,000 things. Uh, and then there's absence. And what do we say about that? Not much to say in a way. And, uh, and same thing in, in, here in Zen and Buddhism, we talk about uh, or it's just this reality, thus, capital R reality, Dharma. But it is also uh, truth, uh, Dharma, truth, reality, but with a capital T. And uh, uh, there are some people, even Zen teachers I've known, we're talking about now about the two truths that we get out of Nagarjuna. And uh, there's some people who think, kind of like I was, not dismissing, but that third part of the be still and know that I am God. I'm just sort of dismissing that naively because I, I wasn't, I didn't have the take on it that the rabbi now was offering me and showing me. But it's interesting here that uh, uh, in, in Zen, we, we have these um, two truths. And then there's some people who, and even Zen teachers I've known, who 
have even dismissed or made fun of, poo pooed the, these two truths, you know, like this is just silly. Uh, I know I don't think he'd mind, but I know when Stephen Batchelor was here, he's 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 looking at a way to kind of maybe modernize or bring up to date Buddhism, something like this. And he's he's ready and willing to just dismiss the two truths, just drop them as some ancient artifact, <laughs> some way of looking at things that doesn't apply anymore. I don't think so. Because in this, when he was talking about I am, also in reading Hinton, he's talking about presence and absence. And uh, uh, we speak of the, the two truths, uh, or we speak of mind. And then there's what? The relative world, the samsaric world, of this and that, birth and death, coming and going. And if we don't See, there's a distinction here. It's a distinction without a difference in a way it's been described. And uh, because in a sense, these are two ways of realizing, understanding, seeing directly. Just really one reality there. But it has this kind of aspect. And the rabbi was telling me about I mean, this eyeing. I thought, well, that's strange with eye. I, I, mean, I see it's not like an ordinary eye, but it's you know, describing it as this reality is of, as a whole. Yeah, I don't think he used the word whole, but see, he was using other words. Then, but as I'm listening to him, it's like he's tapping into a same understanding. And then he was talking about mystics, mystic, mystics that he was known and mystics from uh, times past. He was calling them mystics, probably including himself in that. Maybe he would know me as that. I don't know. I don't see myself as a mystic. But he's talking about the people who understand this teaching to this depth, where they realize there is these two, these twos that are not two, really, because you can't separate. And yet here it is. What is it? That's another way that we talk of this. Here it is, Karagiri Roshi, my teacher. Here it is, here's reality. Here it is. What, what is it? With, without the idea that you're not going to answer, you're going to try to answer this now? Because that's what it will lead us to. Eventually, we realize you can't answer this, but you can see what it's pointing to. We can see reality. And what the rabbi was saying is that there are teachers, he said, but very few teachers or very few people have received this come to this realization. But it's there in the teachings in Taoism and in Judaism and Zen and other places as well in Hinduism. And uh, uh, so we've been having very interesting discussions about this. But he said, like in the, in the uh, Jewish tradition there, where you have the, the rap, there, there's kind of the rabbinical take on everything where you have the, I don't know if you even use the word orthodox again either, but he's talking about the, the people the, who have trained and understood and learned the traditional way, the orthodox way of interpreting, say the Torah, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament as we would know it. And, uh, but in very conventional ways. Uh, and then there's these others who are, they're not, it's not that they're learned or something, but they see through this. They see more deeply than just to take it on the superficial. And that's the same thing that goes on in Buddhism, it goes on in Zen, where we can get caught up in the superficial, the robes and the whatever. And we only understand it from that. And oh, you do this, and then you jump through these hoops, and then you can get certified to do that. And what? The knowledge, the direct, immediate knowing of what's taking place here isn't about that at all. It doesn't come through that. It isn't of that. Wang Po speaks of it as, uh, you know, this is, uh, how does he put it? It's, uh, uh, it's not at all the way to supreme knowledge. 
but very few people come to realize this. Though it's available to any of us, it's obvious. If you look very closely at the stuff that people grasp, and if it happens to arise out of this tradition with this language, you might not recognize, you know, that there's actually pointing at something that's being pointed at elsewhere too, that we can't speak of. But we'll fight over the language, the way you dress, the way you operate or carry out this, uh, even within a tradition. You're not wearing the robes properly or you're not shaking that rattle in the right way or whatever it is. Another thing the rabbi points out that this is where all the religious fighting takes place. It's among those caught up in the, in the traditional uh, way, the traditional views. People are caught up in the pastoral work, you might say. It's not there among people in whatever tradition they do speak in a way that transcends. I don't know, I don't like the word transcend, but it just cuts through all this. But that is what is there. My Christian upbringing uh, was such that as a young person, by the time I was even before I was out of high school, I'd more or less intellectually left <laughs> that, mainly because I was now focusing, turning more towards science. But gradually, pretty early on too, I started getting interested in Eastern thought as I started discovering it. But I realized that there's you know, different ways to gain knowledge. But it's been a lifetime of learning now, I'm 76, been at this a long time, because my deep desire early on, I recognized this, I want to get to the truth. I want to wake up to it, I want to see it, I want to realize it. And we can do that, any one of us, but you will have trouble. It'll be a burden to you if you grasp all of the well, the ritual and the, you know, the baubles and bangles. Now, what's interesting, me talking with, with the rabbi, is that he says, I love all this stuff. The trap, yeah, he calls it the trappings. He says, I love the trappings. <laughs> and I think oh, that's great, you know. And in some ways, too, I admire, you know, some of the stuff when I was in Japan studying there and, and the, the kind of the rituals and ceremonies I saw and things like that. Pretty remarkable, you know, just jive. I was an anthrop anthropologists, you know, I'd just be amazed. <laughs> really, you know, just jaw-dropping stuff that I, that I witnessed there, I saw. But then as a monk practicing there, and I was expected to take this up and to learn how to shake these rattles properly or whatever the thing might be. And I did learn that stuff. But that isn't what I wanted to bring back here to the States or anywhere else for that matter because I can see, I know that there's that something has nothing to do with this in a way, all these things that confuse us, that trap us, that pull us away, distract us from just knowing, seeing directly. And it's interesting in talking with the rabbi that I, he's done a good job helping me to see how all these things do appear in other traditions, but it's with people who, they, they might be using the trappings in various ways, but they're not caught by that, just as the rabbi isn't, because of the way he speaks and the way he talks and the way he can communicate. I'd like to explore that, explore that further with him, you know, that since he is so uh, engaged that he loves the trappings, uh, I want to learn more about that and how yet he won't allow himself to be caught by that. Interesting. The reason I, I don't, when I was head teacher here, I didn't uh, indulge us in a lot of that. Maybe that will start to happen more. I don't know. And it's all right with me. I don't, I don't care because these things really don't matter one way or another. But the reason I tried to avoid those kinds of things, the robes and the rituals and the ceremonies and stuff, 
yeah, that could entice people. And sure, it's interesting. Like, oh, now we're doing something. <laughs> but it's a distraction. And as Juan Paul says, this is not at all the way to supreme knowledge. Supreme knowledge. Knowledge where there's nothing beyond it. We can see and know reality directly, which, by the way, you already do. You don't need something to help you with that. What you need is to notice how you're blocking yourself, distracting yourself, tying yourself up. Like the monk comes in to see the teacher. He says, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, teach me or give me, uh, you know, freedom. You know, I'm bound or whatever. The teacher says, well, who binds you? And he says, no one binds me. He says, well, then, then you're free, you know? So, but of course, uh, no one binds me, but except we do this to ourselves. Oh, and I didn't even get to the point I was going, I wanted to get back to science a little bit here too. It kind of relates to what I'm saying. I better hurry along here. Uh, but there's a, so I'm kind of looking at it from religious, and I'll go back now to science, which is a very profound and useful way to go about acquiring knowledge. But there's limitations to it, and there's very serious dangers involved with it as well. Like dangers. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I just want to read this passage here from a book, uh, Codebreaker. Gene Editing and the Future of the Human Race by Walter Isaacson, very interesting book. Anne was reading it and um, uh, it was a copy from the library. So, uh, and it's right in the middle of it, there was about a hundred pages there were really getting into, into the ethics of all of this, talking about CRISPR here, you know, CRISPR gene editing and, um, uh, and looking at all the, uh, the trouble and the dangers, you know, from that. So finally, now he was getting it into the book. I think it occurred, maybe. Uh, never mind. But it, uh, uh, um, where one young man was into this, and and he uh, went ahead and uh, uh, the, the the real avoidance is people are just wondering whether they should get into germline editing, which means editing our genes in such a way that be transmitted down to future generations. There's other ways in which. You can just edit it for the individual here and maybe cure a genetic uh, ailment of some kind or one thing. So it, it has real potential and, and uh, wonderful freeing you know, options there, but at the same time through this germline editing uh, could be absolutely disastrous. And so there's a big debate, that ethics debate about uh, what's going on here and things are still moving along. And um, um, in fact, it progressed since this book was written anyway, but it's only a couple of years old here. But anyway, but I, I found this one paragraph in the book that I just wanted to read and comment on because it kind of gets to the heart of our confusion here, what we know and don't know or can know and we don't know. And, and it applies to the way we're operating here with science with a very powerful and potentially dangerous, supremely dangerous uh, um, tool of, of, of science here now, this, this CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced uh, Short Palindromic Repeats, in case you need to know what, what that stands for. <laughs> no. Clustered Regularly, in, regularly Interspaced Short uh, uh, Palindromic Repeats. Okay. okay. I, I won't go into that. We don't have time anyway, and mostly you probably wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> But uh, it's an acronym of those words, CRISPR, because he mentions it here. But he said, now, th this is Walter Isaacson who wrote the book, uh, uh, Codebreaker. And anyway, but he, th this is interesting here. Our respect for nature and nature's God indeed uh, should indeed instill some humility about meddling with our genes. But should it absolutely forbid it? After all, we Homo sapiens are part of nature, no less, than, no less so than bacteria and sharks and butterflies. Through its infinite wisdom or blind stumbling, nature has endowed our species with the inability to edit our own genes. If it's wrong for us to use CRISPR, the reason cannot merely be that it's unnatural. It's just as natural 
is all, the, all of the tricks that bacteria and viruses use. Okay. So there's real, there's real debate about how should we use and when should we use and should we use CRISPR, this technique, technology that we have. Well, another thing that comes out in the book too, they're on the verge, in fact, they could right now, maybe they have to some degree. Uh, they can make this technology available to anybody who has a computer and is willing to spend about $100 or so on other equipment where you can start editing genes yourself. <laughs> And I mean like on any sort of organism at all, including humans. And, uh, uh, and, and there are people who really want to, you know, kind of like with the internet, just get it out there and let everybody use it. Just ultimate uh, democracy where no controls or regulations or whatever. Were that to happen and there'd be nobody, you know, pausing, you know, helping us to pause on this. Um, this would be a very dangerous thing indeed. But there's a little piece of wisdom here that's not here, but that's missing. There's a piece, little piece of wisdom that's missing from this that the Buddha gave us 2,500 years ago. And it answers this question because throughout this book and many other books and things that I've read and discussions I've heard on the radio and whatever, uh, there's an issue here that people just, well, isn't it natural? Aren't we natural and can't we? You know, do this? we're just as natural as sharks and bacteria and why can't, you know, and if nature gave us this ability to edit our genes, why can't we just go ahead? There's something they're missing. Here, when if you carry on with that kind of a discussion, and you might very well have, maybe you already have, run into people who talk that way. Well, we're we're natural. I mean, we'll just what we do. It's natural for us to do that. We we learned about this. <laughs> we get into the Fermi paradox. You know that one? It's like well, why aren't there more advanced civilizations? There's possible great civilizations have developed in the universe. You know, our, our solar system is only one third the age of the of the, of the solar system uh, of the universe so if you trust the big bang so surely there must be super advanced technologies and, and cultures and things that are out there and why aren't they here already that's what fermi asked now well, one of the general con uh, you know, I, uh, arguments against that is that well because when organisms get to the point where they're about where we are now and uh, their ability to use technology and whatever uh, we exterminate ourselves. Uh, maybe, maybe that's one of them. <laughs> I have a totally different take on all of this kind of stuff, but I won't get into that because I think that that's really not an, an issue that doesn't make sense. But it says here that through in, its infinite wisdom or stumbling, nature has endowed our species with the ability to edit our own gene. If it's wrong for us to do this, to use CRISPR, the reason can't be merely that it's unnatural. It's just as natural as, you know, the tricks that bacteria and viruses use. No, it's not. Because, did you want to say something? Because of intention. Intention, exactly. That is it. It's, it's one of the two great insights of the Buddha, this matter of intention which is very difficult to understand. I've probably done a very poor job over the years trying to, to teach this and get it across. I didn't understand it myself for a long time uh, until suddenly I just realized and saw it. Uh, it's quite subtle and quite profound. And that is this matter of intention. What is different about us? Yes, for us to, we, we can acquire this this skill, this knowledge, this technology, and we can use it and that sort of thing. And, but this is where science goes and science has to go here. This is part of it, this, this whole thing about forming hypotheses in science, coming up with ideas. Here's a problem. Oh, let's think about this. Maybe we can figure out a way to fix it. And we tinker with it and tinker with it and some things fail and other things, but eventually, yeah, we're kind of getting there. Well, maybe, well, this seems to be the solution to that, but then it's tied into other things. And, uh, and on we go. 
This is why science can never bring us to a truth ultimately. Religion can help us with that, as I was talking of it earlier. But science cannot, pardon me here. And this is the, the great difference. The thing with CRISPR is we will use it with intention. Yes, it can cure sickle cell anemia and it can cure uh, uh, any number of things. I'm blanking out now, but um, all kinds of, um, you know, uh, what do you call <laughs> hemophilia and and uh, uh, any number of diseases, I should have written them down. Um, when I go to a list of stuff, I blank. But just many, many uh, different diseases. Uh, Arlo Guthrie, his father, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, he had this, was it Huntington's disease? Huntington's yeah, yeah, that's, that's another one. And there's many really horrendous diseases and, and maladies that we human beings suffer from or die from. And uh, that could be cured. Yeah, and that's one thing. And it's one thing if you can just do it where you've affected the change in that one individual. If you can do something else that we're gonna make it so, oh yeah, so you make it more resistant to getting AIDS and, and that one can be passed on down through future generations. They'll be more resistant to, you know, to AIDS and things like this. And, and these all seem like, yeah, who wouldn't wanna do this? Yes, but there's all sorts of other things that come along with this and things that you don't see that you never even thought of that are tied to the fact that you've eliminated this, now something else is occurring. Because what is occurring here is all taking place within the whole and you don't control that. Nobody does. And the whole is operating out of a lack of intent, but it is, uh, it is operating out of what one, any one little change that is occurring within it is affected and affecting it is affected by and affecting the whole. Uh, we don't do We don't operate in that way. We get a purpose in mind. We're not looking at other things and we zoom right ahead. I used to be in soybean research uh, in the breeding program. And we used a very uh, powerful, uh, I, I refused to use it even back then. It was back close to 50 years ago now, I think. Anyway, but I... Uh, I wouldn't use it. It's very poisonous. It's kind of like uh, with Roundup today, where uh, they're just, I mean, it's just horrendously, you know, highly carcinogenic. It's getting into the systems of everything on earth and stuff like that. That one was never curbed, but this other one is called Amabin that they did stop it. But uh, I remember I was told by my superiors there and I was working in soybeans that well, it was just, it was a herbicide and it's just specific to broadleaf weeds and it wouldn't affect uh, the soybean. Yeah, but what about the, you know, the critters, the microbes in the soil and the worms and birds and, and on and on and about us? Well, eventually I was really getting into other things and writing and stuff like this and I, I left that job and, and uh, about six months after I did, I discovered that that material Amabin was taken off the market because it was, at that time, it was found to be the second most carcinogenic material discovered. And uh, yeah, but we were using it. Again, like I said, I refused to. <laughs> uh, I'd go to another project or something. Uh, we had little projects here and there we could shift around. And, uh, uh, but, but it's just, as a, and, and even then in looking at the world, as a whole, you know, there's no limit to this. You think it's just going to stop because we, we, have you checked anything else besides broadleaf weeds? Maybe a little bit, or, but there's stuff going on elsewhere all the time with everything. And for us to just have our, our mind focused on what we want to do, and this would be so good for that, and we just go plowing ahead, and we're not looking at what else is taking place. And then sometimes the connections aren't visible and won't be visible unless we study it for the next 200 years. And then we realize there's a connection here. You know, they're discovering now things like, uh, you know, the trees communicate with each other in, in ways where like in forests, they will help shift nutrients over to some other trees that aren't doing so well over there in that patch, you know, and stuff like this. There's these kinds of things 
aren't easily found out. But after enough, um, enough study and looking at it, there's all kinds of connections here. And, and the idea that we would ever learn them all is ludicrous, it's crazy. It's enough to realize that there are these two truths and one of them is this wholeness and totality and we should never lose sight of that. The people who wake up to this knowledge and this uh, realization, they don't lose sight of that. And, uh, but if we think that it's just what's right in front of me and I can manipulate this and move it over here and it makes it better for me here. I mean, in small ways, sure, fine. I don't, I don't mean to stop doing anything. But when you have something like CRISPR that could be passed on to future generations or you're spraying this chemical all over the place and uh, uh, without any thought as to what, it, what's it, what is it really affecting here? Because you've only studied this. In fact, in the case of Roundup, you had, what was it, Monsanto that developed certain uh, crops that were genetically modified in a way that, that would be resistant to Roundup. Well, what about the rest of the organic material or life on the planet here? No attention was given to that. Now they see it everywhere in all kinds of organisms and it's highly toxic, highly carcinogenic. Anyway, I have almost used the entire hour, which I didn't really mean to do, <laughs> but I did want to get into this other thing. But that's the whole thing too about in using knowledge in the way that science operates. And science is very powerful. It's very good, very useful tool in many ways, but it should be done with certain limitations. And certainly when we get to something as powerful as this, we really should put a lid on it. I could go on about the like, development of plutonium and other things as well. It has a half-life of 125,000 years. How are you gonna keep that safe from future generations? Is if, are there gonna be future generations at the rate we, we're going? So these are things that have, but there's, a, there's another kind of knowledge that actually works together with uh, this. And that is uh, where I was, uh, talking there earlier when I was uh, speaking of my, some of my conversations with the rabbi. So anyway, but I have used up the hour. <laughs> I should have left time for questions, I'm sorry, uh, but I better end it. Uh, is there a burning question? Nobody burning here? Maybe I shouldn't, okay, good. <laughs> I better end it, thank you. Okay.